1919, Japan commissioned its oldest class of cruiser that would see frontline service in World War II. These were the two ships of the 3,940-ton Tenryu class. Like all Japanese-like cruisers, they were named after rivers. Design work began in 1915 with help from the British under the Anglo-Japanese Naval Agreement. Being very light cruisers, these ships were meant to be destroyer squadron leaders. Remember, this was effectively before radio, so communication was mostly by signal flag, blinker light, or simply follow me. Destroyers at the time were simply too small to accommodate a squadron commander and his staff. As such, these ships were only slightly better armed and armored than the destroyers they were meant to lead. Like many destroyers, they had a very pronounced forecastle deck that dropped down to the main deck behind the number two gun. They did have the advantage of being mostly oil burning. Main armament was the new 5.5 inch 50 caliber gun. Very quickly though, it became obvious they were too small. As a result, the original order for six was cut to two and work began on larger ships with heavier firepower and the ability to act as scouts as well as leaders. By World War II, these two were pretty worn out and well overdue for replacement. They were considered the B team. Actually, they were considered the C team since the battleships were considered the A team and the carriers, battle cruisers, newer cruisers, and destroyers were considered the B team. Only the obvious material need for ships against a foe that could outbuild them kept them in service. Still, unintentionally, throughout 1942, due to being based in the South, they did see considerable service. Main armament was four hand-worked 5.5-inch 50 caliber guns in four single open-backed mounts, all on the center line. You can kind of see the guy sticking out the back of number two gun here. One in front of the main superstructure and one behind it. One in front of the aft superstructure and one behind it. These were the same guns that were the secondaries on the Issei and Nagato class battleships and would be the main armament on most succeeding light cruisers. They were also used on the carrier Hosho, some auxiliaries, and as the most prolific shore battery. In October 1917, as part of the national conversion to metric, they were redesignated 140 mm 50 caliber. Each mount weighed 20 tons. Maximum elevation on these ships was 20 degrees. Being hand operated, maximum training and elevation was 8 degrees per second. Being manually loaded also meant they could theoretically be loaded at any angle, but realistically up to about 10 degrees. Recoil was about 2 feet. Muzzle velocity was about 2,800 feet per second. Rate of fire was about six rounds per minute. By World War II, they fired an 83 and three quarter pound shell. Please consider these were hand worked with a six and one quarter pound bursting charge. Propellant was in a single 24 pound bag. Maximum range was about eight and a half miles. By World War II, they also had the incendiary shrapnel shell. Secondary armament, really heavy anti-aircraft, was a single 3-inch 40 caliber gun on the quarterdeck aft of gun 4. Remember, this was 1917, so anti-aircraft wasn't that big a deal yet. Torpedo armament was six 21-inch tubes in two triple mounts, one mount on either end of the funnel that could fire off either beam. Propulsion was provided by 10 boilers in three lateral rooms sitted front to back, each room venting to its own funnel. The forward room had two small oil-fired boilers, the middle room had four large oil-fired boilers, and the aft room had two large oil-fired and two small coal-fired boilers. These provided steam to the three turbines, which generated 51,000 horsepower for running the three propellers to a maximum speed of about 32 knots. The forward engine room held the two turbines that ran the outer shafts, while the rear one held the turbine that ran the middle shaft. They had one rudder. Befitting their role of destroyer leader, armor was minimal. Two and a half inches of belt armor protected the sides of the machinery spaces, while one inch of deck armor protected its top. They carried no aircraft. Modifications were minimal. In the mid to late 20s, 
both added a tripod mast. In 1940, the coal boilers were converted to oil firing and they replaced their 3-inch gun for more medium anti-aircraft. In January through March of 1943, Tatsuda, now essentially reduced to a training ship, added types 21 and 22 radar. Four depth charge throwers and two depth charge racks for 60 depth charges were fitted. There was only minimal additions to their medium anti-aircraft. On December 7th, Tenryu and Tatsuda were at Roe and left port to support the invasion of Wake. When that didn't go so well, they returned to Roe. On the 21st, they again set out for Wake with a significantly beefed up force. After the fall of Wake, they returned to Roe at the end of the month. In late January 1942, they covered the invasion of New Ireland. In early February, they covered the invasion of New Britain. In early March, they covered the invasion of Ley and Salomeu. At the end of March, they covered the invasions of the Shortlands and Bougainville. In early May, they covered the invasion of first Tulagi and then the Port Moresby invasion force. But following the Battle of the Coral Sea, that operation was called off and by the end of the month, they were back in Japan for a refit that kept them out of the Battle of Midway. Back in the Solomons, in late July, they covered the invasion of Buna on New Guinea. The day before the Guadalcanal invasion, Tatsuda left Rubal, escorting transports to Buna. Tenryu, meanwhile, took part in the overnight battle of Savo Island, where she probably helped sink Quincy, despite being hit herself by an 8-inch shell. In late August, they covered the invasion of Milne Bay, but the invasion was beaten back, and in early September, they helped evacuate what was left of the invasion force. On October 2nd, an air raid on Rubal blew a 16-foot hole in Tenryu's deck. Repairs took most of the rest of the month. Tatsuda, meanwhile, helped ferry troops to Guadalcanal. Near the end of the month, Tenryu evacuated troops from Welly Island, while Tatsuda went to truck, then Japan, for overhaul, repairs, and then training. On November 13th, 14th, Tenryu took part in the force that bombarded Henderson Field on the night between the first and second naval battles of Guadalcanal. In mid-December, Tenryu covered the invasion of Medang on New Guinea. At about 9.15 p.m. on December 19th, while covering the invasion, Tenryu was hit at the stern by two torpedoes from the submarine Albacore. Since they were Mark 14s, surprisingly, both exploded and soon Tenryu's engine rooms were flooded and she had lost all power. Two hours later, at 11.20, she finally sank stern first. With a desperate need for transports, in mid-October 1943, Tatsuda, which had by now been essentially relegated to training in home waters, along with the battleships Issei and Yamashiro, ferried troops to truck, then returned home in early November. At 3.15 a.m., on March 13, 1944, only 40 miles southwest of Yokosuka, as part of a convoy headed to the Marianas, she was hit starboard by a torpedo from the submarine Sandlance. With both engine rooms flooded and power lost 12 hours later, at about 3.35 p.m., she sank stern first. Since this was short, let's take some time to look at the famous Type 93 torpedo, which again I want to reiterate was not fitted to these ships and Japanese radar. Yes, Japan did actually have radar during the war, though it wasn't as good, reliable, or numerous as American or British radar. Basically, Japan had three types of ship-borne radar. The first was the Type 13 air search radar. It had a range of about 60 miles against large aircraft like bombers or groups of small aircraft like carrier planes. Against single small planes, it had a range of about 30 miles. Its reliability was spotty. About 1,000 sets were built. The second was the Type 21 air search radar. It had a range of about 65 miles against large aircraft like bombers or groups of small aircraft like carrier planes. Against single small planes, it had a range of about 40 miles. It was first fitted to Issei in April of 1942. It also was notorious for being unreliable and breaking down. About 40 sets were built. The third was the Type 22 surface search radar. 
the lower horn transmitted and the upper one received. It had a range of about 20 miles against large ships, 10 miles against medium ships, and 6 miles against small ships. It first started getting fitted to ships in March of 1942. Yep, it too was a maintenance nightmare. About 300 sets were built. In addition to these, the Japanese had radar detectors. Moving on to torpedoes, the Japanese had a few different types of ship-mounted torpedoes. The most numerous and famous was of course the Type 93, the famous Long Lance, though the Japanese didn't actually call them that. To them it was simply the Type 93. There were and are two things that made them so famous. The first was their size. While most ship-borne torpedoes of the era were 21 inch, they were 24 inch in diameter. This meant that whereas most British and American ship-borne torpedoes had a warhead between about 500 to 800 pounds, the Type 93 had a 1,080 pound, actually 490 kilogram, warhead. As a side note, they also didn't waste time messing around with the exotic magnetic detonators that gave other countries, not just the US, so much trouble. So their detonators actually worked. Their second and most notorious feature was of course that they burned pure oxygen. Most torpedoes use engines, as opposed to, say, batteries. That is to say, much like your car, they mixed a fuel with an oxidizer, air, then ignited it. Of course, since they're underwater, they have to bring their own air as well as fuel with them. Most countries use plain old air, which is only about 20% oxygen and 80% other gases, mostly non-combustible, like nitrogen. So by using air, you're wasting about 80% of your oxidizer supply. Whereas if you use pure oxygen, you're 100% combustible. Also, because your oxidizer burns 100%, it leaves a much smaller bubble trail. So why wouldn't you want to use pure oxygen? The answer is because it's 100% combustible. This is too much of a good thing, especially if you compress it to get more in a given space. Just pure oxygen is very flammable. Compressed pure oxygen is very explosive. By the way, that's part of the reason you see no smoking signs all around hospitals. It's also the reason that other countries, despite testing it successfully, didn't proceed with pure oxygen torpedoes. The danger just didn't outweigh the benefits. Japan, on the other hand, decided to roll the dice and risk it. So really the question isn't, why wouldn't you use pure oxygen? The real question is, why would they? The answer was the Kassen Kantai, the great decisive battle. The night before the battle, cruisers and destroyers were to bonsai charge the American battle line and use their torpedoes to whittle its numbers down. It was to be the linchpin of the battle. This meant they needed to be very proficient at night fighting have great optics, aka binoculars, and heavy hitting torpedoes that could be launched before the Americans could see them coming and blow them out of the water. The only real solution to getting that kind of range was to use pure oxygen. As it worked out, this turned out to be technically difficult due to the oxygen's volatility. For example, to start the torpedo, regular air had to be used, then it was switched over to oxygen. I'm not even going to get into storing and maintaining it. The results, though, was admittedly pretty impressive in its performance characteristics. Work on the Type 93 began in earnest in 1933. The work on burning pure oxygen dated back to the 20s, and it finally entered service in 1935. For fuel, like most Japanese torpedoes, it burned kerosene. As I already stated, warhead weight was 490 kilograms and the whole torpedo weighed 2,700 kilograms. Remember, the Japanese were thinking metric by now. Range was, you can really see the advantages to using pure oxygen here, either 11 miles at 48 knots, 18 miles at 40 knots, or 22 miles at 36 knots. By comparison, the US's Mark 15 destroyer launch torpedo, which entered service at about the same time, had a range of about two and a quarter miles at 45 knots, 
four and a half miles at 33 and a half knots or seven miles at 26 and a half knots. So in short, even at its fastest, aka least fuel efficient speed, the Type 93 way outranged its American counterpart, even at the American's slowest, aka most fuel efficient. So how did they do? Well, unfortunately for Japan, not so good. By the end of the war, the famous Type 93 mostly fired at night just as they had planned on which they had pinned so much hope achieved slightly better than a 5% hit rate. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say since even great weapons are useless if you can't hit stuff, maybe Japan should have spent more time on developing that radar thing rather than mega torpedoes. Maybe that's why modern surface ships are festooned with radars and other electronics and not ship-to-ship -ship torpedoes. I will grant you a legitimate argument can be made that anti-ship cruise missiles could be described as the descendant of ship-to-ship -ship torpedoes, though. Either way, when the Allies got a hold of the Type 93, they were impressed with its characteristics, but noted it wasn't really innovative. There wasn't really anything new or forward-thinking there. Their attitude was mostly that's extreme, why would you want to do that? And then they moved on. 